Hello, DDRA team, members of uh, DDRA Mail Club, my clients, my subscribers, my followers. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again. And as you can see, that I am um, having, a, you know, I am talking to you from uh, the beautiful town of Albury. So you can see Albury behind me, and the backdrop is Albury Township. Um, but, you know, I am from Melbourne, I am in Albury now. And I'm talking to a designer who's uh, based in Sri Lanka and she was uh, till recently she was in Melbourne and she is of uh, her ethnicity is Sri Lankan just like myself it's a different ethnicity and we are in a different country so Nip Nipponika has um, is a widely traveled fashion designer she's finished her uh, degree in costume and fashion design in um, Australia, but now she's gone back to um, Sri Lanka, the beautiful Sri Lanka. And we will be talking about, she's doing exciting things. So we'll be talking about all that she is doing right now. So Nipponika, um, we'll not, you know, we'll take the road less traveled by. We will not start with uh, what we, you know, you have been doing and how did you happen to, you know, how did, why and how did you aspire to be a fashion designer? Uh, were you making clothes for your Barbie dolls uh, when you were a little kid? You know, so this is the usual stuff. So we just move away from all of that. Uh, suffice to say that you have uh, very successfully completed your studies in fashion and costume design. And you've gone back to Sri Lanka. And that brings me to my first question. Uh, why did you go back? A lot of people um, do not go back to um, their home countries once they come to Australia or once they go to the, in South Asia, it's very normal that, you know, people go to the United States, the nor Northern Hemisphere, uh, and then they decide to stay on. So why did you, um, decide to go back to Sri Lanka. So what, what was it uh, an attachment to your family or motherland? Um, what was it that prompted you? Uh, you were very well, um, you were doing very well in Melbourne, very well entrenched. But um, yeah, how and why? Tell me a little bit. I guess it was more a personal reason because um, so my sister was like just about to leave home as well to go study abroad and so my mother would have been like alone uh, so I kind of decided to come back be with her and when I got back actually I did start really uh, exploring my heritage and finding new opportunities so I spent a lot of time uh, when I came back even like wood carving kind of like really trying to explore and like find all those crafts and all the heritage that I hadn't been able to see for the last like for the years that I was in Melbourne yeah so primarily it was mum who, who was the reason behind your you know returning to Sri Lanka I can understand because I would feel very you know I would fe feel very lonely without my daughter uh, but uh, so completely understood and i know sri lanka is such a lovely country that you cannot stay away from uh, sri lanka uh, for a very long time um now you have an, a design aesthetic what in you know um, in fashion lingo we would call the handwriting your handwriting or your signature so it kind of combines sustainability with uh, it's very inclusive and it is sustainable so would you expand upon your design aesthetic a little more and tell us exactly what is it, what is your message, you know, as a fashion and costume designer, what is it that you are wanting to communicate to, um, you know, your audience? Yeah, I think sustainability is probably the core of what I do. It really informs even like for custom designs as well as like the brands that I have. It's very like that is the core of it. Um, I think it's important because
places for years and years we've been promoting with polyester so um, I try to kind of merge sustainability with our traditional crafts um, so kind of looking at like at the moment uh, we're really looking we've been looking into hand loom which is so um, it's all hand woven hand done by these artisans that they've been doing it for like years and years without any specific thought of it being sustainable we kind of already were using cottons and it's all still um, unmechanized so like actually when I went to um, to these like craft villages you can see them all um, kind of like they make the yarn they dye it all by themselves and then they have these like big hand loom machines and everything is like really kind of hand done so that hand done aspect is also kind of I think linked to the sustainable part as well um, and so yeah with heritage like that and I think also in terms of like when we're looking at actual garment production what we try to do a lot of is not to to reduce waste so we um, are using natural fabrics we also use a lot of dead stock so our fabric manufacturers we actually ask them like to have any excess stock we would really like to use that instead of anything that's made new um, and we keep a lot of our scrap fabrics as well like we kind of just don't throw it away we keep it and then we use it for like to make accessories kind of um, patchwork into um, different little things at the end of the year and really try to reduce um, waste and just turn it into something new at the end give it new life try to yeah reduce our waste as well yes uh, I mean I noticed when I saw some of your collections you know I mean I have seen you as a student but as a post graduation you've been doing so much interesting work and um, I saw that you are practicing the three R's very well, and it's it's not the not just three R's anymore. It's it's been added a fourth dimension. So it's it's first of all it's refuse, then it's reuse, reduce, recycle, and you are doing all of that with your patchwork collection. And and thankfully patchwork is very on trend right now, which which warms the cockles of my heart, you know. Uh, but I saw how beautifully, and you're talking about you how you're using leftover fabric. It's pretty much what we at Dida we do it with our toys, and that's the whole reason we started making those toys. But you've got one step ahead of me, you know. So you've uh, in a way surpassed me and you've made those beautiful garments out of just scraps of fabric so i i obviously when i put this video and Diderati for your benefit i want to say that when you see this video on youtube you would see how uh, i would post some of the pictures as well so you'd see how beautifully nipunika has used just scrap fabric waste fabric and she's made all of that into uh, wearable garments so tell me more about the patchwork collection i'm very excited about it yeah so this particular one actually um it was done for pride like i did it during pride month um and i'd wanted to do something for pride for a very long time um because in south asia it's still like a bit of a bit of a taboo subject we don't always talk about it so i wanted to create something that was like visually stunning also had kind of like um i guess celebrated what pride was and this happened during lockdown and I was essentially organizing all my scrap fabrics into colors. Like I just took everything out, started reorganizing it. I couldn't go out at, like anywhere at this point. Um, and so I was thinking about how to kind of incorporate that into what I want to do. And all these scrap fabrics were from previous projects, um, orders. Um, I think some were even my mom. Like my mom also doesn't throw out scrap fabrics. So they're really old ones in there as well. Um, and so what I ended up doing was uh, the concept for this was kind of um, each of these pieces of fabric has a very different history. They've all got kind of an identity, which is very much like how everyone in the LGBTQ community have very like these, these uh, incredible unique histories coming together to form this like vibrant community. Um, and so that was kind of what I want to do. So I formed into like a rainbow mosaic. Um, and yeah, it was very like, it was a lot of planning involved in this because it was very like color specific <laughs> and everything had to be like matched with patchwork. You had to make sure everything is like nicely aligned. Um, but yeah, that's the inspiration behind it. It was really like, I really want to do more of this kind of patchwork. I really like um, forming like colors and shapes through like patchwork like that. I think that's something I want to do more of. 
Yeah, it looks easy, but you know, it's like fitting together a jigsaw puzzle and you know, within that pattern and everything. So patchwork is not as easy as easy at, as it especially if you're putting lots of little fabrics into a garment so and you have to get the alignment right so it's not that easy so obviously you are trying to smash you are trying to shatter a few stereotypes especially because i am also of south asian origin and i know how difficult it is to get rid of you know stereotypes in traditional societies but you know there are a lot of good things about traditional societies as well it's not all bad news um so uh, i have also noticed that um, if you used a lot of traditional imagery you know traditional influence in your work and you've combined at times you know it they don't gel like when you're trying to do two things but you have blended uh, traditional influence traditional imagery beautifully with your you know the contemporary techniques the contemporary silhouettes um and i can see a lot of uh, south asian influence in your work but you know if i am in australia today i'd still be able to wear your outfits so uh, that's that's probably you what that's probably you what you've been aiming at am i right yes yeah. design aesthetic is definitely kind of like a combination between traditional and contemporary and trying to like match those in like in a really wearable way because i think people should be able to kind of celebrate their heritage and wear it like that and i actually remember i remember in one of your lectures very early on you actually asked us to do like a merging of two cultures and i think that's maybe one of the first things that kind of thank you like i remember <laughs> and i still remember like doing that thinking okay this is actually interesting because i think what i learned from that also was kind of um i think the first step is probably understanding like your craft understanding there has to be meaning you have to understand your craft where you're coming from the traditions um like when you work at traditional craft as well you have to understand why it's important to the communities and being respectful of that as well um and then kind of comes like looking at silhouettes um and traditional garments and what i kind of I try to do is like look at these kind of with saris you have a lot of draping with incredible um like silhouettes that come from that so i try to almost replicate it in more of a constructed manner like using my very like strict design principles you learn in school like in university and kind of use those principles to um kind of make that more wearable that people can like put it on easily and kind of be like okay this is actually modern i can actually just kind of throw this on like i would throw on a pair of pants or something like that like kind of trying to make it really accessible as well right um but your true passion um niponika and correct me if i am wrong it's really costume design isn't it like if you were to select between costume and fashion i have a i have a sneaky feeling that it'll be costume isn't it am i right or am i not right <laughs> when i started uni definitely i like wanted to do costume and that's kind of where my heart lies in terms of like i love telling stories and like the the visual media of film and costume and that kind of stuff but recently actually after i started working it has kind of changed because now i have two brands um so like that's very important fashion um as well as like i do um there's this thing that i've kind of realized is when i do orders for clients uh there's this exciting thing of you get to kind of know their personality and um what they like and kind of turn that into something like a garment which is kind of similar how you look at characters in costume which is how i like to think about it um but and even doing like avant-garde work for some of my australian clients um yep. I, i have like some coming up in october so i'm really excited about that so that kind of also lets me bring in that really exciting kind of strangeness of costume and like into there um but i do i do want to do more film i do really want to do more film and work in that as well as in i i also miss theater after lockdown i haven't been able to do anything related to theater and in melbourne i got to do that as well as um oh there was a western um production mamma mia that came here so that was the last thing i've done 
for theater, but that was also really exciting and very different uh, kind of like atmosphere. But I don't know. I kind of I'm trying to find the balance in between doing both of them at the moment. Uh, there's still time you can explore you can experiment and then you can find your you know you find your direction after a while so and you could do both actually you could do both as well so long as you are doing justice to your project so you are i mean i saw some of your yeah, i think your night out collection was was one of them and i did see the cosmic queen and then you how you synergize human forms into an insect the the praying mantis you know and i have been able to study the praying mantis because i have one which kind of he or she has adopted me you know he lives in my kitchen and you know flutters about and i when i saw your praying mantis and i I thought, okay, this is this is pretty authentic. The way you you know you you synergize the the three. I think there are three human forms, isn't it, that come together to form a praying mantis, which is so interesting. And uh, that's something very surreal, which is what the costume what what costume design design and designers of today they are going beyond. You know, I used to I don't know another thing I used to tell you. I don't know all of my students that you know in fashion or costume design you have to open your third eye so you have to look beyond what's obvious to let's say any person i mean just a person on the road or a person um you know a normal lay person we as fashion designers we have to see beyond and that's that's what's coming through in your collection that you are looking at things beyond you know what they actually do, just appear on the surface so we are able to uh, delve deeper into a concept which is which is exciting you know so that's that that's that's what's required of costume designers if you take say for instance mad max um or some of these uh, you know uh, you're talking about cinema films or um, let's say Sag the Soleil. So it does, you know, you have to, unless you have that, you know, you open your third eye, you wouldn't be able to do a thing about those projects, you know. Um, Nipunika, now, because you and I share a common origin, we are both from Asia, South Asia and Asia. So there's a question, and this is not my dilemma. I think it's a dilemma that's faced by uh, all um, non, you know, occidental fashion designers who come from the Orient. So, uh, you know, I have been asked that I have been very often asked, so you are a fashion designer and you are of Indian origin. And I say, yes, so am I. Um, uh, so what do you do? Do you do Bollywood? Uh, then I tell people I I've done Bollywood. I've worked with several actors and different kind of movies, etc. But I'm pretty much mainstream now. Now, particularly, you know, I work for a very Western audience. My wholesale clients, my retail clients, and the problem is, if I were to do Bollywood now, people would be saying that, of course, she's of Indian origin. What do you expect her to do? Like she'll do Bollywood. So, but this is not this is not original Samita comment. You know, it came from Akira Isogawa, who is an Australian designer of Japanese origin, and he said, "If I do kimonos, people will ex if I don't do kimonos, people will expect me to do kimonos. And if I do kimonos, they'd say, okay, Akira, after all, is Japanese. <laughs> what do you expect him to do? Just kimonos.' So, as a South Asian and a colored fashion designer." I know I'm touching kind of a raw nerve here, uh, we, but you know, we always, all of us, we have to smash that glass ceiling one way or another. So as a fashion designer, and you're pretty new, uh, you still haven't probably uh, coped with as much as we have, but have you had to smash a few glass ceilings like, or any stereotypes that you've had, in, you've, you've encountered and you've had to uh, battle with? yeah that is there is always this kind of like assumption that you're gonna like see sari jackets or do like traditional wedding wear as well that i've found um, yeah i think i think it's i think i was kind of um maybe aware of this when i went to the new york so i was like okay i'm 
going from my home country to this like very different, very multicultural as well like place. Um, and I did have a thing in my mind that I was like, I'm going to try everything. So during uni, I tried to do like Western. I tried to do like the really crazy costumes of like praying mantis was like a, maybe the most extreme one. Um, and then only towards the end, I think I kind of delved into more heritage inspired pieces. So I kind of, I had really tried to kind of get a good broad like portfolio. And even now it's kind of maybe got even more varied so i think trying to have uh i've tried to have like a really diverse portfolio so that people kind of if they've seen my work they're kind of like okay she doesn't just do one thing she kind of like you can i've kind of kept that at bay so far uh but yeah i think there is like that assumption you kind of just have to maybe unfortunately prove yourself a little bit like really like make sure your work is work speaks for itself in a way absolutely absolutely you have to prove people wrong you have to tell and i i remember you were like a sponge you know you were ready to i mean i can say it now i didn't say it then because i would have i didn't want to sound biased uh, in favor of someone or against some other people but i can say it now that i was impressed with your passion for learning like you were like a sponge you know, uh, soaking in everything that we were trying to give you, you know, you didn't let go of an opportunity. And that's what's uh, stood you in good stead. And it's brought you so far. Um, now, some practical questions. And this is the information I want to give to members of Diderati, uh, Dida Mail Club. Um, you are, uh, you know, very, you know, you are open to a wider audience, as I can see from your I went on to your website, um, did a little bit of research, and looks like that you are reaching out to a wider audience. And you are also uh, open to custom projects, and you are also open to, um, you know, uh, any kind of turnkey uh, project as well. You know, be it cinema, theater, uh, movies, anything like that. So. Um, where do we get in touch with you? What's the best way? How do we get to know more about Nipunika Fernando? And how do we suppose someone, of course, if people and I know after every interview, I get queries from my clients, my followers, listeners. And if they get in touch with me, I'll obviously put you on to put them on to you. But on this platform today, if you just let us know where is it that we can find Nipunika Fernando, what's the best way of uh, getting in touch with you? Yeah, so um, I do yeah, I do a lot of international um, orders now. I'm luckily working with my Australian clients from before. I kind of have like a good um, method of how to do this efficiently, which is good. So uh, my social media as well is good to kind of see what I do and get in touch with me. So that's Nipunika Fernando Design. I like instagram facebook and then my website also i've got like channels where you can first look at my work and then even like send in inquiries there as well yeah so the best thing is to when i put this on youtube i would put all your socials there so people can get in touch with you now the big question and the big uh, the large feather in your cap so how did the fashion week happen the colombo fashion week is uh, those of you who do not know South Asian Fashion Week, Colombo Fashion Week is probably the most prestigious in Sri Lanka. Am I right, Nipunika? I think it's the best and the biggest. Um, and uh, getting on, uh, getting to show your collection on the ramp at Colombo Fashion Week is is not a mean, not not a small achievement. So, how did that happen? How did you? First of all, how did you land this? You know, how did you end up at uh, on the ramp at uh, Colombo Fashion Week? Secondly, how did you prepare and how did you show? So any challenges, any experiences that you would like to talk about? So you could share all of I'm sure some of uh, some of my audience, some people who are listening in today um, might want to show themselves. They might want to show on um, in, in fashion weeks and uh, on ramps, you know. So, what are your what's your advice for them? Yeah, so it's really exciting because it's basically an application process. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So if you, um, over like a hundred applicants get applications get sent in. They whittle it down to ten in the end. And through that, there's like a huge mentor mentoring process. You've got industry professionals kind of teaching you about um, all these different things. Like I learned a lot about um, color, especially as well. 
um, like how different, um, like how you do color, how color for retail, how traditional, um, even like depending on where you're from, you look at color differently. Um, that was really interesting. And um, so the whole concept of our, for our collection for this year was, again, like it's a bit turning kind of traditional Sri Lankan into contemporary wear. Um, and so uh, elements of like saris and things like that were in there. And the process was, I mean, there was a lot of feedback that we got from our mentors that I had to kind of take back, a lot of experimentation as well. And one of the things we really focused on uh, for this year was, for this collection was print. Um, so print was a really big part of it. And the inspiration for the print was um, these um, traditional masks that are used in um, dances and rituals. And so we actually went to like, see them get carved and uh, we saw the colors, the kind of how people do it, how they paint it, and we were inspired by that. And so then was the issue of, was this, I guess, the um, kind of learning how to uh, put it onto the fabric as well as possible because we're using natural fabrics again because there's very heavy um, sustainability act, um, yeah. kind of aspects. Even of CSW, they really push that like sustainable fashion thing, so which is good because that's like the core of this collection as well. So natural fabrics, printing on natural fabrics was, we ended up using screen printing. Yeah. Um, and so we made sure like our, we worked really closely with our printer, made sure that it was eco-friendly, non-toxic pigment inks. Um, and so there was a lot of experimentation um, with that. And especially getting the colors right, getting it to fit on these like hand loom fabrics and then on our linens, which we had um, a lot of as well. And so this is a different process because we had actually done um, print before uh, with a lot of color for our brand Amuzu. So that was also like a huge process of where we had to go to different manufacturers trying to find the best one because with natural fabrics, people are always a bit like, do you want to just use polyester? And they're like, no, we are using 100% cotton and that's how we're going to do it. So as a huge learning process for that and then coming into this with um, a slightly different uh, take on screen printing and we're doing overall print. So actually like the whole process and my team and I like through the end, like I had a lot of, um, a lot of work went into it. A lot of people worked on it as well. And like finally seeing it on the runway in the end, like very, just really rolling up in months of like developing and creating, going back and forth. And yeah, it was really, really, really rewarding, I think. And yeah, I love that. I love that they have a sustainability aspect as well. It's very important. And we actually get to show for retail as well. And I think we get to put it up um, like for retail on their website. And that's like, that kind of the opportunities for that is also like really, really good. So what now? What's next? What's what's happening next, Nipponika? You know, what in future? what is it that have you had offers from fashion week or what is it that you'd like to do in future yeah so i guess the most the newest project we have up um so my team and i actually we work really closely with um handloom for the colombo fashion week collection and we met these we met a lot of craft people who do this we got to see um like the different parts of their lifestyle like and so what we're trying to do now is uh, to actually, um, so something we found is that we had to kind of set a standard for handloom, kind of like um, the quality, the colors, making sure the dyes are like, like fast like every time, all of that. So we've been working with them to actually um, develop this and then kind of give it and kind of um, show it to a more um, broad audience, even internationally, because we want to, we want this fabric to, we think it's amazing. We know that it's sustainable. We love that it's hand woven. And we want to really support the communities as well because they also yep. need to be able to sustain themselves, sustain their craft, find a market for it as well. So we've been really focusing on getting that done and like, like yeah, basically kind of trying to push hand boom and like show the world what it really is. So really excited about that. So that's, I guess, the newest thing um, that we're doing. Um, as well as kind of the developing prints and designs for our brand, kind of seeing where, what we're going to do next. Um, and also, we're still actually looking at even more traditional crafts. We um, have been looking at Biralu lace, which is um, very unique Sri Lanka where it's like this. They put in the designs with pins and hand knots and faces, like even kind of Yeah, yeah. 
a very interesting thing that we kind of uh, have been looking into recently. Uh, so yeah, uh, and even like, I think in general, more looking into more sustainable ways of making and printing. Printing is a big part of what we do now. Um, so yeah, just kind of developing, developing. Wonderful, yeah. which is so good to know, you know, if uh, upcoming designers like you, you know, you take up, um, you know, you become the spokespersons for uh, artisan communities and sustainability, um, then uh, I have reason to be happy about, you know, the future doesn't seem, uh, because at times you feel um, so upset when you see these things disappearing or uh, everyone, as you said, talking about plastic fantastic taking over the entire world. So, but when, you know, designers like yourself and you go back to your roots and you give back to them, then not only the not only the sustain, not only the environment, but you are also talking about the communities. And I think um, the communities and the environment, they go hand in hand. So um, Nipunika, it's always been a pleasure to connect with you. Um, and it's been wonderful talking to you. And I'm so happy that you are just going from, from strength to strength. And uh, that's why I made it a point that in spite of all the travel that I've been doing since morning, I still wanted to see you and I wanted to touch base with you and, and, uh, and hear about what is it that you are doing now. Uh, so all the best from myself, Samita, and my team and my uh, listeners. I'm sure someday I would, you know, you would be definitely getting um, a big award for costume design or maybe you'll have a very successful uh, fashion brand so all the best to you and may you prosper and thrive so uh, so that's it it's a, a, yeah, absolutely lovely likewise and uh, so bye for now and i'll uh, you know i'll jump onto your website every now and then and uh, i'll definitely follow what you are doing and you know i think i'm already following you on your social media and I try to repost anytime I see some good work. So I'll keep doing that and all the best, Nipunika. You so may, you, may you prosper. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.